Greetings, everyone. This is Dr. Bill Fisher. I'm on the faculty of the School of Library and Information Science at San Jose State University. And I want to welcome you to our colloquium session for today. Uh, I am the coordinator of our colloquium program for this semester. And I'm delighted to introduce our two uh, speakers today. Uh, as you see on the screen, we're, we're trying something a little different uh, and having an interview format. Our primary uh, guest today is Wendy Ding, who's a PhD student from Peking University. And Wendy is right now a visiting scholar uh, in San Jose. So um, she is, is with us here uh, on the West Coast. And she will be uh, talking about her research and, and uh, what uh, doing a PhD is like uh, from a, a Chinese perspective. And she will be interviewed by our own Anthony Bernier, uh, an associate professor with the School of Library and Information Science. And so he will sort of uh, act as a moderator in that regard with Wendy. So let me turn things over to them. And Anthony, I think uh, you're up first. Thank you, Bill. Um, Wendy, we're very glad to have you here today. For the uh, listening audience, I wanted to suggest that uh, uh, Wendy is a, a graduate student, a PhD student in the Department of uh, Information Management at China's Peking University. Um, her current research project is funded by the National Social Science Foundation in China, and she investigates reading culture and reading promotion. Um, she's visiting with us as a uh, in residence in the United States for one year, sponsored by China's Scholarship Council. And in addition to talking about her own research uh, today uh, in her interview, uh, Wendy uh, will also be addressing the nature of earning a PhD in China as a graduate student. So, uh, in addition to talking about the the changing nature of her um, reading culture research. So Wendy, thank you for joining us today, and, and uh, we're, uh, we're very appreciative that you were able to spend this time. I would like to suggest for the audience as well that, um, of course, Wendy's uh, first uh, language is Chinese, and English is her second. And so we have um, prepared some questions in advance. And uh, this is also a new experience for Wendy in terms of interacting with a live uh, and recorded uh, interview session uh, online. So these are all new things for, for us, and so we're hoping that uh, we'll have a good experience. I'm going to turn my video off now since uh, you've already appreciated the fact that I'm wearing a, um, a San Jose, a San Jose uh, white shirt and a tie, and I will, uh, I will resume my um, ominous and um, omniscient invisible status now. Thank you, Anthony. I'm glad to talk to you too. I'm going to turn off my video too. Okay. So now we will concentrate on the whiteboard, that, and Wendy has prepared uh, a variety of uh, slides for us as, as part of our question and answer experience. So Wendy, let me start off by asking if you could share with us um, a brief introduction of uh, the doctoral programs of library and information science in China. Okay. Um, in China, uh, the library and information science program, we usually call it the information management program. Uh, usually the PhD program of this is like four years. You have to first take an exam to enter the school, and then um, you choose an advisor, and uh, you have classes like for one year, and then you have three years for your research. Um, and at at the final, you have to give a report like for maybe ten, uh, for maybe like a hundred thousand characters. Yeah. Mm, uh, and uh, mm, the most famous uh, PhD programs for library information science in China mm, is like you, you can see here. It's one is the Department of Information Management in Peking University, where I am come from. Uh, it's like the left or upper picture. Another is the Schools of Information Management in Wuhan University. It's a lower right picture. Another is including Nankai University, Nanjing University, Zhongshan University. Um, in these PhD programs, you usually can choose your major around um, like uh, editing and publishing, information science, library, file management, information resource management, or information marketing, and so on. Thank you. 
Okay. Wendy, a minute ago you mentioned that there's an entry exam that, that students who are applying for their doctoral program need to, need to take and pass. Could you talk a little bit more about what that entrance examination is and how did you prepare to take it? Okay. Um, the entrance exam for the PhD program is usually like national exam. Um, usually you have to take exam for, in, for your English and your another two exams for your major. Um, when I entered my PhD program, I take English, library, and your reading promotion, these three majors. What, what um, is, the, is the nature of these examinations? Are they, um, are examinations, are they timed that you take them in large rooms with lots of other prospective doctoral students? Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah. And how did you prepare to take the examinations that you took? Um, usually for me, because I'm just a, uh, just a graduated from a master degree when I take this exam, so I didn't use a lot of time preparing my English because I have always been studying. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I think it used, my, used me like two months preparing for my English exam and another like half a year preparing for my other two exams. Or uh, usually you have, they have a book list suggesting you reading. Um, you usually finish reading your book list and uh, you also chat with the like advisors you would like to have or uh, ask him about to, like what he research in because uh, because we have like two parts of the exam when you pass the first part of the exam as I mentioned there is another part that the teacher were interviewing you um, at that time your advisor has their like power to decide whether he will have you hmm. wow. um, okay well, let's go on to, to the next question then. Um, what are the job opportunities like currently for library and information science PhDs in China? Do you have any idea about the job opportunities in China, for example, for PhDs from the United States in library and information science? Mm, okay, because in general that there are only about 20 student, library, students graduate from library and information science PhD degree every year, so usually we can very easily find a job. Um, there are four mainly like areas we go for work. Um, first is of course the libraries. Um, we go, or uh, we usually go to the public library or the university library. Or uh, they would ask for a PhD degree in library science if you want to apply for research librarian. Um, for other positions, if you have a PhD program, you can usually have a better chance than other people who applied. Uh, second, um, we can be a teacher like in university, like not only for library and information science program, also like for publishing program or for like news programs, we have a very wide choice. Uh, but in order to be a teacher in the university, the competition will be really intense. Um, second, um, also like uh, I think um, we have students work for the government as like information analysts or information science researchers. Uh, the fourth, we also go to companies, like companies focusing on information, focusing on publishing or consulting or analyzing. I think in all, we have a very wide like job choice. Uh -huh. Which mm, piece of this yeah. pie do you imagine yourself uh, occupying when you finish your doctorate? I'm hoping to be a teacher, yeah, but I don't know if I can get that. <laughs> And also you said something about like your students being in China. Um, I think the U.S. PhD program students in China will even be welcomed than our own students because I do heard of some Chinese students who take their PhD programs in the USA and then come back to China. Uh, the schools are more willing to have these students, also the government and the companies, because they think like they have a more wide view and their like language is better. So I think if you come, if your students go to China, they will have a better chance even than us. Mm. Of course, they would have to practice their Chinese language skills. 
And yeah, <laughs> okay. that's true. But but now universities are very welcome teacher to just to give English classes, so that would not be a very big problem. Okay. Well, then let's turn to your own experience. Um, what led you to elect uh, to study uh, to prepare for and study for your doctorate? And why did you choose library and information science? Mm, I have been studying library and information science as I just entered my university. Mm, choose this major when I enter university is because uh, what I believe in the meaning of my life. Because I think it's to see and know more about the world. I think one way to do this is to be the place yourself and to see the other ways to read them uh, and the stories from the book. So I choose libraries. Um, as to study for PhD program, I think the most important reason or I can say the most important person to affect me is my professor in Peking University, Mr. Wang Yuguang. Um, when I first met library and information science, I considered like it's only a cause to train myself to be a professional librarian. But my advisor took to me a lot and led me into many of his programs where I see that library and information science cannot only that give books to people, but also help them like improve their reading, improve their learning skills, improve, help them to build a good manner, to help the society to perfect the tradition and customers and make like a much better future. So I want to learn more in library and science, so I started for a PhD program. Also, I think my advisor's way of living as a teacher in the mm. university really attracts me and I want to be a teacher too. So you have to have a PhD degree if you want to be a teacher in China. Mm. Very good. Um, can we talk a little bit about some of the um, most influential scholarly works in your own area of research? Mm. Pardon, I don't hear you very well, sorry. Okay. Uh, why don't I save that, that follow-up question for um, a okay. little bit further down because I think that might be more applicable uh, later. So let's move on to uh, another question. Uh, would you please tell us about your own doctoral research uh, and what steps did you take in order to develop it? Um, okay. Uh, the first to choose my research question, uh, in my first year of my PhD study, my advisor took me into one of his research programs studying about the change of the reading culture in China in the 21st century. Hmm. In that program, we really discussed a lot about how quickly the growing the economic and the new technology changed Chinese people's view and way of reading. And there Many of us were very really concerned about the future of reading and the libraries in China, where, they, where the paper book reading really die, where the library disappear. So are we thinking about is there anything we can do to make things better? With this question, I started to pay attention to like all kinds of reading policies from the government or reading promotion from the like libraries, publishing companies, and schools, and others. Then when I talked to my advisor to say I was interested in this area and want to do it for my PhD program, my advisor suggested me to take only like one subject to log into this problem so I can see it deeper. So I choose the subject and I'm most familiar with, that's the library. That's how I get my like research question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then I'd like to talk about the research method I use. Good. Uh, yeah, at the first step, I want to have uh, like an overview of the reading promotion programs being carried out in the Chinese library. So I use like existing date and case research to see all the main kinds of reading promotion programs. I mainly see this like from all the network, from uh, the website of the library, the reports, um, and the, that make new Then I 
or according to the characteristic of each mankind, um, I maybe use the survey research to interview the readers and the librarians to ask them to fill out a questionnaire, or I just attend the activities myself and to see myself how they work out. And sometimes I use both of them for one kind. Mm, and uh, then I think because these all these like reading promotion programs has a very clear intent result that is to re promote reading. So I also do evaluation research of this each kind of program. Mm, then this year, as I have the chance to study in the USA, I am also doing some comparative research to see the difference of reading promotions being carried out in Chinese libraries and USA libraries. Yeah. Can then, I um, stop you? At, can I stop you at yeah. this point and and ask you to, if you could, um, give us an an idea of what you are finding in your comparative evaluation of reading promotion programs in China versus the U.S. Uh, yeah. Okay. Mm. Uh, like in China, the reading promotion programs like they are in a large, much bigger size. Uh, usually, like they have lectures for like three or four hundred people to listen to and uh, they have like very large plaza events for maybe comp champions or whatever. But like this uh, reading promotion activities in China, they like only happens once maybe uh, they have the budget or the library, the leader of the library has the idea they hold one like activities, but they didn't last or they didn't have a regular like time to do this. But in the USA, I can see that like libraries doing like this reading promoting activities, maybe not very big, maybe only like talk to or uh, tell stories to the young children, but they do it like for every week and uh, have people like can count on it and the readers of the library usually uh, come every week to like maybe listen to their little classes or maybe the storytelling. Yeah, that's I realize I think, that um, you are still early in your research, but I'm curious to know um, which do you think is a better model? Um, actually, I think the U.S. way is a better model because. In China, when the, China, the library leaders don't think of it, maybe there is no library a reading promotion programs for half a year, and suddenly there are ten promotion programs in a sudden, and it's like it don't last. And people maybe uh, become interested when I listen to one lecture, but when they know more, there is no other lectures or advice for them, and they kind of forgot this, and suddenly it comes again. It's I think the USA way can like gently breed the people's mind and maybe <laughs> use to read it much better. So would you talk a little bit um, about the, the process by which you're collecting your, your data? Um, okay. Uh, as I have mentioned, um, I first usually try to have an overview of these programs and, and that I classify them into eight main kinds, and in each kind, I chose 15 presentive cases. I try to make these cases vary in either the size of programs, the libraries that carry them out, and the readers they are mainly face to. Or the main parts of my data usually come directly from my observation interviews or questionnaires um, as I sometimes concerned about information gathered from other ways like official dark news, news or government reports. Okay. Um, so then what insights do you hope to deliver to library and information science uh, as a result of your research? Mm, okay, in my first level, um, I want to show people what libraries have done or are doing in promoting reading, how these reading promotion programs have been planned and carried out, and what's the result or evaluation of them. I hope this can be a little guide for future reading promotion activities. In the second level, um, I want people to know that libraries are still playing a very important and useful part in our lives. Although nowadays we can easily get books from everywhere, libraries, I think, is still a very good 
place to read to improve yourself and to help our live a better life. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that there are um, some concerns that you have about the information that you have gathered. And the concerns I would imagine could be from the methods that you have chosen or they could just be from other sources, I don't know. But would you talk a little bit about the concerns that you have about the information that you have gathered? Uh, yes. Um, uh, the most important part of the concern is come from the information that I gathered mm -hmm. from the second hand, as I said, from maybe official documents or news or government reports. Um, there are many two concerns. One is the incompleteness and the inconsistency of the information. Um, as there are no direct standard rules for libraries mm. in China to keep their records of their everyday date. Yeah, such as reader visiting a library or books being read. Although we think it's important, but there is like no rules for them to keep them this record or how they should keep it. So when I collect in this date um, from different libraries or even from the same library but this different period of time, it may come into like inconsistency. I can give an example for uh, when I collecting the, the everyday people, readers coming to the library from uh, both the Shanghai Shanghai Library and the Jiangsu Library. Uh, the Shanghai Library use the people that go into the door of the library as this number, but Jiangsu Library collects them as the people that are using their library card. So there is an inconsistency. Mm, the second concern about this is the the true the truth of this date I collect. Mm, because in China there's a tradition that at the end of the year or at the end of the program a library have to do some paperwork to report how their this year works or how these programs works. Or, and there's sometimes suddenly when they have to give up this report the the upper or uh, person said, I need this or that date in this report. But the library are unable or didn't pay attention to collect this date. So they just make it up sometimes yeah. uh, in order to fill this report. But when I see the report, I can't tell maybe whether this is fake up or just a truth. Um, yeah. The critical evaluation of our data collection methods is one of the more difficult things for our own uh, gateway PhD students that we're working with to, to deal with. Um, people when they come into our program they look for a methodological approach whether it's quantitative or qualitative and yeah. they latch on to a particular approach but they're not, um, it takes a long time to develop the kind of um, critical sophistication that you were just talking about in terms of talking about reliability and consistency and then yeah. how does a scholar respond to those those uh, problems or conflicts or liabilities with that particular data approach. So it's um, so you've done a, a very good job already in, in characterizing some of the challenges that you face and these are any data collection method pr pr presents challenges um, and the, the um, it's up to the scholar, though, to, to try to respond to those challenges so that you can still continue collecting data and, and deriving new insights. So thank you for that. Um, would you, is there anything else you'd like to say about the nature of your research at this point? Uh, okay. No, I well, think let me go back to the, the question I asked a, a moment ago to, uh, that I postponed a little bit in our interview, and that is to talk um, uh, you mentioned that your your um, doctoral supervisor was very influential in mentoring you and introducing you to the notion of uh, getting your doctorate. But I'm curious if there are any particular uh, scholarly works that you read while either while you were getting your master's degree or early on in your reading that have become very influential for you. Uh, yes. Um, uh, I think a serif book named uh, The Books and the Reading um, uh, is what I started my like 
research in the reading promotion program. And the chief editor of this series is my professor Wang Yuguang. And uh, it's in the year, I think, 2006. He cooperated with six libraries in China. And uh, they choose six topics according to the specific, uh, according to the, like, the, each library's characteristic. And they choose classic books reading, popular books reading, children's reading, young adults reading, family reading, and they're falling in love reading. This is just a topic as a research topic. And there are six books about the library books and reading. These books use the very first hand date and the cases from the, these libraries and give us a very like detailed and vivid description of the reading promotions in Chinese libraries. Mm, and also, there is another book I'd like to mention, that is The Reading Treatment by Wang Bo. He is a library and information science journal editor in Peking University Library. It talks about how librarians can help readers use books and readings to relieve their negative emotions, keep the balance of their mind and bodies, and improve themselves. This is the first book that introduced reading treatment in Chinese libraries. And when I read it, it really changed many people's idea of the reading and the way that libraries doing like their reading promotion oh, service. That's fascinating. I, I'm also quite jealous um, that that the scholars in China have been able to assess a uh, significant but controllable number of core topics and then produce monographs on each one of those core topics for the profession and for students. That I'm very jealous of that. I wish, for example, I had such a resource myself in young adult services um, so that we could we could start read this book and then move on from there. Uh, I think that's fascinating and maybe you should help me, uh, you should translate that book for me so I can find out about what is, what is going on for reading promotion in young adults in China. Um, okay. Yeah, I'd like well, to Well, let's that. move on then to um, another another uh, area. Um, in, in the United States, we um, we enjoy a, uh, a very large associational and collegial uh, organizational community for um, library uh, researchers and instructors, uh, for generalists and those who are more specialized in, in their research interests. Would you talk about the associational life for PhDs in China? Mm, yes. Uh, I think in China, the biggest and the most important associations for library and information is the Library Society of China. It's it has like over maybe a hundred thousand members, and these members all include from library and information science professors, researchers, instructors, students, and librarians. Uh, my and all my classmates are the members of this like association. Um, it also has a journal named the Journal of Library Science in China. Uh, and it holds in like every annual conference. These are the two most important places for us library and information science, maybe students or researchers to present our ideas and research and to meet and talk with other library information science professors or students and maybe find mm -hmm. our future job also here. Um, I think another important organization is especially for library and information science PhD students is called the Library and Information Science Doctoral For Forum of China. This forum is run by the Information Management Department of Peking University and uh, all of its members are library and information science PhD students from all over the country. Um, this forum usually organizes regular like lectures and meetings for our students and to keep them updated with the latest and hottest topics in our area and share new research findings among them. Um, also, uh, there are many other like local associations according to the area or specialized association according to their like research interest. Our like our library and information science students can choose to join according to our research. Wendy, during the time that you are going to be in residence in California, 
Are you going to have the opportunity to attend any of our own U.S. associations, for example, the American Library Association or the California Library Association? Um, yes, actually, I uh, give. Uh, I I would like to present in the Library Association of America uh, annual conference in Chicago this June. Yeah, and also I talk to a lot of like librarians who are members of these associations, and uh, uh, I'm also planning to uh, join their get together in I think maybe two in two weeks on the 16th of April. I think these associations help us to know each other and to talk and to share our experience. They're really Wendy, nice. Wendy, uh, Lily posted to the, uh, Dr. Lua posted to the um, chat room that you are actually presenting at the ALA in Chicago this year. What is the, the, the topic and what is your presentation about? Uh, uh, my topic is about the emerging technology, how it influences our reading promotions in Chinese libraries. Um, I would like in that presentation. I would like to talk about uh, several specific several specific cases uh, that library use emerging technology to help them promoting their reading. Good. Um, well, congratulations for getting your presentation accepted, and um, I'm going to see if I can attend because I will be there myself. I, I've had the opportunity uh, last year to make a presentation before the Asia Foundation which is located in the United States, and they brought over a delegation of um, Southeast Asian library officials from 14 different countries, and they were all interested in reading promotion, and so we, we had very many, uh, some opportunities to talk and exchange some of the, uh, the, the practices from both sides of the Pacific, and very few of them were talking about emerging technologies, so I would imagine that the work that you are doing uh, and talking about at ALA this year will be, will be very relevant in the, in the Chinese um, uh, community of librarianship and as well as beyond China. Thank you. Um, uh, this must thank you to my advisor here for Lily because, yeah. Okay. Because she is right. major in emerging technology, so yes. she really helped me a lot doing like this kind of preparation. Okay. Uh, what role, let's pursue the technology a bit more, what role does technology play in how you conduct your own research, your own work, um, and uh, what role do you imagine that playing in the future as an LIS instructor? Mm, okay, I think technology nowadays plays a very important and indispensable role in their study and research and teaching work in library and information science in China. Um, as a student, we may use computer and video technology to take classes and uh, lectures from all over the world. Also, um, we use them to, to do my, our homework. And as researchers, uh, this technology help me collect and analyze all kinds of data, cases, and information. Also, uh, Remote interactive technology also allow me to cooperate with other researchers from different places. Um, I think for the future, uh, these as a development of technology, the information sharing and research cooperation will become more and more common international in our area because as our library information is rarely focusing on information and technology. When you, the um, experience that a, a lot of doctoral students in the United States have in terms of learning new technological innovations um, and emerging technology, both to help them with research and also with teaching, usually is a very informal process where one, one doctoral student will mention informally that they found a new method or a new program to help to take better notes on the readings that they are doing for their research or another one will find and, and mention in an in informal way that, um, oh, I found this really good way to record a lecture for my class. How do students in uh, uh, your, your colleagues in 
the doctoral program in China. How do you usually, as a student, find out about these new uh, technologies for your own work? Mm, okay, I think many of us also find this technology in the way you have already mentioned, but there are like two other ways. One way is like we sometimes have classes for them. Like I have to take classes for how to use huh. micro office program or uh, like programs but yeah we have classes for this. And there's sometimes when teacher give out a a homework, he would told you to use some kind of technology or program to finish this homework. You have to like give his homework in the in, in use this program to give him the homework. So, so that's, that I responsibility think, the then sometimes is given to you by the instructor, and you need to complete the assignment. You have to find out how to yeah. use the technology, complete the assignment, and then deliver it with the new technology. Huh. Yeah, we have to do that. Uh, I'm not so sure that would go over so well in the U.S., but um, I think that's a very good way to, to approach it. Um, well, let's, let's move on a little bit further to the broader notion of, of the studying of reading. Uh, why are you interested in the, the notion of reading? Mm. Uh, as I have already mentioned, uh, I like libraries and reading from when I was very young and I chose and uh, I think, think it's a, almost a, I really didn't get the main point. It's the same question about how I chose library and information. Okay. Um, we've been asking questions rather rapidly. Um, are, you, um, are you caught up on your slides? Or is this the slide that you would like to currently have on the whiteboard? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, well, this this is a good connection then to to the next question, which is the the notion of the changing nature of reading culture in China. Can you talk a little bit about the ways that you see the culture of reading changing in China? Mm, okay. Um, I think sir changing of reading culture in China in the last 10 years has been greater than the change that has been occurred in the whole last century. Um, and there, hmm. I think there are three main symbols of the reading, change, reading, uh, reading culture changing. The first is what we call the shallow reading. Um, nowadays, uh, like in the past, Chinese people consider the main purpose of reading as a core, a core knowledge. Um, so the classic books and the popular science books or reference books are always the best sellers. But in, uh, nowadays, people like more consider reading as a leisure or entertainment. So they are more tend to read like easy books. Uh, novels, um, and uh, they don't pay a lot of attention in choosing books. Um, also, they uh, one maybe they many times they didn't finish their books and they never come back to it. Um, another symbol is their picture reading. Uh, as I have mentioned about, people are not now pay much attention about how to choose their books. So the books that can attract them at first sight, which is picture books usually good at, are are selling very well these days. And as picture books can usually be marked as a higher price, so the publishing companies are more willing to publish picture books, which pushing this trade even further. Um, the third symbol is uh, the digital reading and network reading. Um, as the new technology help us not only can read from paper books, but also like from mobile phones or computers or e-books. Um, I think the major young adults in large cities in China now totally give up paper book reading. Um, uh, uh, although these like new reading technology come from the USA, I think it's influencing China even larger than the USA hmm. because when I was, yeah, because when I come here, I take buses and sometimes light reels. I saw people take out a paper book from their bag and read. But in China, you can 
kind of never see this. People are usually take out their phones or pads, maybe read some e-books or watch movies or play games. If you take out a paper book, people will look at you kind of strange. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I am very interested in the notion of shallow reading as you characterize it here. Um, in my own work with, uh, with young people in the United States, the institutions, uh, schools for example, uh, libraries in particular, uh, typically do not um, spend much time or energy or effort examining the, the, the ways that young people read and write. And I refer to this practice uh, instead of shallow reading as fugitive literacy. Um, the kinds of informal things that, that young people do when they write, the kind of uh, literacy tasks, for example, that they may have to perform uh, at a job they may have, or the kinds of fun reading that they do either in terms of uh, digital technology or in other of their activities. And the school, of course, is trying to promote more complicated reading tasks, which makes sense. But the library's role is really not to uh, privilege one kind of reading over another, and yet for a very, very long time, that is what we do. So we want to promote particular, particular kinds of reading, not just the act of reading or the practice of reading, but particular kinds of reading. And that has, that has um, created a very strong and long-lasting cultural wedge or uh, a separation between young people and libraries. Libraries are seen as places that promote only certain kinds of reading and not all kinds of reading. And so that has been a, a big problem and a big cultural uh, conflict in the library between the library and young people. I'm curious if, if that is a phenomenon that you have seen um, or you study in China. Mm, when I say about shallow reading, um, I'm not only mentioning to young people. I'm saying that now all kinds of people, even like college students, like to do this kind of shallow reading. They don't want to read complicated words, books. They, they like to read like they like to read what are usually read by like children or young adults. They think it's easier. They don't need to think that way. That's what we're trying to persuade people not only do this shallow reading, but sometimes also come back maybe to classic reading or more complicated Well, reading. it seems then that um, from your point of view, um, libraries in China share that, that cultural privilege um, of more complicated reading with the uh, attitudes of libraries in the United States. Um, I, I would like to see, for example, libraries promote shallow reading almost as much as a more complicated reading, uh, especially among young people, and, and then let young people themselves and their own interests determine the kinds of things that they read, how often they read, where they read, what they write, and those kinds of things. I think that libraries have um, alienated young people for so many decades because we have only defined reading in a very narrow way rather than a more um, rather than in more complex and broad ways. And so young people have come to see libraries only as promoting a certain kind of reading, but not the kind of reading that they care about. And so they, they avoid libraries. Yeah, that's the problem in China library too, because um, as libraries are like promoting ki kind of classic or what we're reading, the shallow reading books, books for shallow reading, like are very little in library, but actually these kind of books are um, satisfy the young young people very much. But when young people go to the library, they usually right. can't find right. these books they like. They usually only find it's only classic been books. Very recently, yeah. that that there has been a strong impulse in the United States among libraries to incorporate, for example, uh, more recreational reading, things like uh, anime or um, comic books, it's been a long debate in libraries uh, if, if these kinds of informal or shadow, shallow reading kinds of um, uh, instruments uh, belong in libraries. And many libraries feel, no, they do not belong here, and yet that's exactly what young people want. 
Uh, actually, in China libraries, kind of library try to collect all kinds of books. Uh, they also, many libraries collect maybe comic books or like this shallow reading books, but the problem is so many people like these comics books and shallow reading books. So uh, when these books come to library, maybe they come at the mm -hmm. same copies with the classic books, but they are usually lend out very quickly and mm -hmm. you can see only classic books left in the library usually. Yeah, I have been trying to apply for like a comic book in my college library and I have to wait maybe like two or three months for it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, okay. So uh, um, among all of the differences, we see a commonality between libraries in the United States and libraries in China. Why don't we move on to a, a, a new question. Um, Okay. Uh, you pointed out that libraries are playing an important part in reading promotion, and this is the nature of the, the core of your, your, your research. Can you give us some examples about what kinds of work libraries in China are doing to encourage and improve people's reading? Mm, okay. Um, in China, like, uh, the libraries are doing, usually doing reading promotion activities in the way like, uh, opening lectures, holding exhibitions, planning big reading events, set up readers' clubs, or offering personalized book recommendations in all kinds. And here I like to talk about an example uh, that, holded, uh, that holded by the Capital Library of China in April 21, named the Books Exchange Market. And this reading promotion is using like the emerging technology to help the library promoting reading. Um, it's under April the 2nd, Capital Library of China posted a topic, uh, Books Exchange Market on its Xinlang Weibo. Uh, you can see like the left upper pictures. Uh, the Weibo is kind of like Twitter in the USA. And, uh, uh, this topic is to encourage its readers and followers to bring books and magazines they no longer reading to exchange with other readers. Uh, this topic is very quickly commended and forwarded by its fans and quickly spread out among the online readers groups. Um, uh, during this like activity, the capital libraries keep on posting news, photos, and uh, communication with its readers about their questions and feelings using this Weibo stuff. Um, and uh, in the two weeks, over like a thousand readers uh, respond to these acti online activities and change over six thousand wow. books. Yeah, it's really a big success as the use of new technology mm -hmm. reading promotion reading. Well, let me get a little more specific then in looking at reading promotion. It, assume that you are um, a library director in China and among these kinds of reading promotion activities, how do you, what are some of the things that go into helping you decide which promotions or which program campaigns would work best in your library? Mm, I think if I am the library director, someone proposed a reading promotion program to me, I will first ask two questions. Um, does this program, do we have the best resources to carry out this program? And does this program really fit our readers? Um, as for the first question, for example, if my library want to open the lecture, I would try to ask if we have the best speakers to give these lectures. Um, if er, if we want to have a very big plaza event, I will check if we have enough budget because I believe if I want to do the reading promotion program very efficiently and uh, has positive efficiency, not only as a news or something to write in my annual report, uh, to have the right resource is like the base. And, uh, as for second question, for example, if I'm holding a champion on weekdays, likely the retired people may be the main readers I'm facing. So I think a champion for writing maybe traditional Chinese characters were much better than a champion like maybe doing science experiments. Okay, thank you. That you'd be a good library director, I think. Um, if we, um, you suggest that that thank one you. of the two concerns you would have in choosing a 
way of reading promotion is the kind of readers that a, a particular library has uh, as their base of um, users. If we consider children uh, and young people as recipients or participants in such programs, would you tell us how these programs might take place in Chinese libraries? Mm, okay, in China, the reading programs for young children, uh, for children and young adults, are usually divided into two parts. Uh, the first part is for the per school children, and the other part is for the primary and secondary school children. Mm, as the per school children are very young and may they usually come to the library with their parents or grandparents. So the first ones usually face into the whole families. And they may be like uh, mo mo movies or music time for the family, and maybe storytellings for the children, as we can see in the left upper picture. And uh, there are also like lectures for parents to how to educate uh, how to take care of their children and uh, what books should they buy and suggest to their children or read to their children. Um, as the second ones, uh, as the children and young people are much larger, um, there are more variety kinds of activities because uh, in China, uh, like secondary and primary students spend a lot of time in their schools. Library usually cooperation with schools to carry out these activities. As you can see, like in the upper right picture, it's a, a story reading group in school libraries. And, and there, there another two pictures. One is the like reading champions in the library. And, and the other is like, for the sign up for small, uh, sign up for summer reading programs in library. Wendy, to follow up on that, I, I've been recently asked to, to give a, a keynote lecture at the National um, Children and Youth Library in Seoul, Korea in June. One of the things I'm going to be mentioning to them is that uh, in terms of uh, new things in the United States in youth services is that young people participate much more in the planning stages of programs. Um, but in the images that you have on the screen currently, um, the, then you see children um, singing and, and, um, and creating uh, graphic um, uh, drawings and so forth. To what degree in China would you expect that young people themselves would be part of the planning stages uh, and choosing the topics of these programs? Mm, I think they play very little in this part mm, because in China, uh, usually like the, uh, like maybe some librarians uh, give, give up a proposal of a program and uh, their leaders see if they like it and sign for it and it was taken out from up level to the down level. Like they send these rules from libraries to each, like maybe send it to teachers or like, yeah, then they, the teacher sends these rules or what to do to their students and the students okay, just follow that's the rules. Okay, thank you. Um, so why don't we take a look now at, at one of the, um, the later questions, and um, we have uh, two more, and then we can have uh, we can have a little bit of uh, questions from some someone perhaps in the audience. Um, um, you have been in the United States for several months now as part of your residency. What are what observations have you made about studying and researching um, the differences between China and the United States? Mm, okay, I have to say there are really big difference. Mm, as for study, I like to compare the same master courses in library and information science. Like in China, almost all the master degree students are newly graduated students. Mm, very few of them have already been work for some time and come back to school again. But I can see here that most of the students or just have been working for some time and maybe they think they need some more knowledge or what, they come back to school. I think this is partly because the entrance exam or for the master degree or even for the PhD degree in China is kind of hard because they all have like English tests 
when people leave school and go to work, they kind of give up their English and their, their or maybe their professional studies. And their, if they want to pick up and study it again and to take the exam, it's really hard. Um, another difference is that uh, I think the master and PhD courses in China are much easier than in the USA. Uh, I can see in USA like students only like take two or three courses each semester and they have like six or even more work to do for one, one courses. But in China, um, usually one course only has one or two homework to do and we can usually take six or even more courses one semester. Wow. So usually the master study in China, the, the course study only lasts for one year and you have the whole second year to prepare him for work or what. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then another difference is I see like gra uh, students graduate from our library and information science programs has a more wide in job choicing. As I have mentioned, they can work in libraries or government, companies, schools. Many, many of them work in the area, like don't have very much connection what they, with what they have already studied. And I have, I have classmates from my master program who has been a, a, a journalist and who has been a lawyer who has been working for the banker and uh, other, but as uh, I think less than 30% of our students will remain in the traditional area as libraries. Um, but I can see as American, the major students graduated, they stay in the library areas, maybe be a librarian or something related. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, let me jump in here and thank both Anthony and, and Wendy for uh, what has been a very interesting uh, uh, conversation and a very enlightening conversation, uh, very well prepared. Uh, thank you very much. We do have some time uh, if there are any questions from uh, those of you who are participating in this session and all you need to do is uh, either raise your hand or just click on your uh, microphone and ask a question and I'm going to actually ask Anthony to uh, moderate any Q&A session that we might have here. Well, I have, I have one question I'd like to ask that we didn't prepare for. Wendy, do you have a particular favorite U.S. library experience since you've been here? Um, yes, I I really like our library, I have to say, um, because in China um, there is no library that combines the school library and public library together. Um, there are usually like public library libraries are usually kind of make some noisy and there are like children around here and there and there, in school library people like usually do only doing their homework. They use the library more as a classroom, not really as a library. Um, but here I can see that uh, you combine this together very well. There are rooms for families, for publics, and there are rooms for students. Um, and I really like it. So this, this would be, when you say our library, you mean the uh, Martin Luther King Library on the campus at San Jose State? Uh, yes. Okay. Are there uh, any other questions? Well, then let me let me close off uh, our interview with uh, with Wendy Ding and uh, thank her very much uh, for for agreeing to spend time with us today and talking about her experiences both as a as a scholar and as a uh, doctoral student in uh, library and information science in China. And uh, we hope Wendy that you have. Uh, an excellent ALA presentation and that you enjoy the rest of your residency here. Thank you very much. Thank you too.